I'm going to talk about um, something that's going on in parallel, I'd say, to cinema right now, but has a chance to inform it and invigorate it and obviously learn a lot uh, uh, from it. Um, so, so this is... Uh, kind of the fundamental question, right? So I know that you guys have seen videos as you've gone through YouTube, probably some of ours, uh, uh, and, and, and been like, 10 million views? Really? Why? <laughs> right? It's, it's crap. Or, or, or some variation of that, right? And in and, and, and thinking about, like, you know, the, the way that I, I kind of came up uh, in this business and also Jonah Peretti, you know, we, we had early viral hits and we, we said the same thing. It's like, why did people pay attention to us? Like, we weren't worth that much, you know? And the content that we made was also, it wasn't the kind of content that you would expect that, uh, to, to, to go big. It wasn't the kind of content that I think culturally we'd all agreed on was the best content. Right? And that's this big question, is why is the content that we all value as being the best, the most riveting, the most incredible, why is that stuff not traveling as easily in this new fabric of the web? Right? And why, why is it favoring this other stuff? So that's the, that's the question that I'm going to be looking at, and I'm going to try to tie it in to uh, you know, the, the, the future of cinema. So for me, this image is crucial in the understanding of this problem. So those of you who don't understand uh, or don't know what this image is, it is a face palm, right? So this is a face palm, okay? It's Captain Picard, obviously, face palming. And, and the, 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 the weird thing is that this image is everywhere. Google face palm, you know, tonight when you go back, and you'll see that there's millions of variations of this image with text under it and all this kind of stuff. And so the question is why? Why would this image, which you would never hang on your wall, which is not a great piece of photography, why is it ubiquitous in web culture? And I will posit to you, because uh, that's what one does on a stage like this, I posit uh, that this is an incredible fulfillment of the promise of a picture is worth a thousand words. If you drop your cell phone in the toilet, this is what just happened. <laughs> I don't care how much text you use to explain how stupid you feel, you will not match that, right? And we start to do this all the time. In fact, we have become a culture that is obsessed with the appropriation of images in the service of deeper, complex meaning, right? Emojis are a perfect example of that, and we're doing it all the time, right? Every time a new employee starts at our firm, I have to request more storage for my email account because it's filled with this stuff, right? And what better way of describing friendship than a sloth that's giving you a flower? There is none. It's been measured. Same thing with sadness. Come on, Batman in a swing in a rainy day. So it, it, it gets to this underlying question, which is, which is potentially there's different usages that people have for media. And one is the one, you know, when we're in this room and, and we see these incredible <laughs> archival uh, pieces, one is this notion of giving yourself over to something. It is losing oneself into something. And you even say that, I lost myself in it. And you've had this experience where you're sitting in a room like this in a dark place, and you are in the Andes. I mean, they, they, they set it up in the clip before Henry. It really is this appropriation of self into another space. You are outside of yourself, and you're just there. You're living it, and it's incredible, and you cry. You do all kinds of stuff. Right? And then the movie's over, you go outside into this weird, bright daylight, and half of you is back in the cinema, and like, you know, you're still like, whoa, what just happened? And you're shuffling, and you realize, oh, I came to the movie with someone. And, and, and then you turn to them, and you're just like, you know, like, what'd you think of this? Uh, what'd you think of the movie? Oh, it was, it was, yeah, it was pretty good. Like, there's a huge dissociation between the experience that you just had, which was transformative and incredibly personal, incredibly deep, and the way you talk about it, right? And then there's this other usage of media, which is now a lot more apparent because of the, the technology that's emerged, because of the way that we can measure, the, because of the, this sort of like ubiquity of this, this networked world, which has to do with some other usage of media. And that usage is when we use media as a proxy for communication. Right? We're using media to speak to one another in, in some sort of a way. And that's, that's the sort of fundament of how we start to think about it. <coughs> so 
in, in order to, so it's a bold kind of claim, right, to, to create a whole new category of, of, of media uh, consumption, and, but, but there's a really easy way to test it, and the one thing you can do is you can start looking. You, all of you in this room probably have shared a piece of media in your lifetime, whether it's in an email or in a text or on social networks, and generally what you do is when you share a piece of media, you, you write something to justify why you're doing it. Right? You don't just post the thing. And those are share statements. And we can look at them. You can look at them. You can even ask yourself, why do, you, why do I share? Why do I do it? We started to see three categories. Now, there's probably many more, but these are interesting starting points. One was share statements where people said things like, oh my gosh, this is totally me. Or, hey, this is totally you. Right? Or, I never thought anyone else felt this way but me. Right? And we would call that shares where you're using media to broadcast a part of your identity. And where the media does a better job of explaining that part of your identity than you probably could. Or it gives you permission to. Or the reverse, where I'm using media to recognize part of your identity. You like dachshunds, this has a dachshund in it here. You like it, right? Hopefully. This also explains, by the way, why you probably get a lot of people sharing stuff with you that you already know. And you kind of have that thing where you're like, mom, why would you send me that? Like, this is something I learned like, you know, 10 years ago. I'm way past that. I'm a genius now, right? But it's actually, she doesn't really know that much about what I do, you know? And she's sort of like saying, this is kind of in the vein of what you do, right? The second category would be something called emotional gifting. And that's just like, this made me feel this way. It will make you feel this way with some kind of reliability. And you can see how that would really rest on simplicity. Like, if this will make you laugh, it will inspire you. The third category would be something called social information, where what you're doing is you are reinvigorating a conversation that already exists in your social sphere. The share statements on that is, hey, we were just talking about this the other day, or I was right. <laughs> right? So, so, so then what you do is you start looking at these different pockets and you just start making assumptions. Okay, if people want to broadcast parts of their identity, what are facets of their identity that they might want to broadcast? There's genetic. There's genetics, red hair, uh, left-handedness, all these different things. There's things like uh, your sexual orientation, your uh, uh, culture of origin, your occupation, your location, all these different kinds of things. You create these maps and then you go ahead and you make them. And you make lots and lots of them. We've made about 4,000 videos in the last two and a half years. And we try lots of different variations. Uh, Wyatt's art out there for a lefty. I'm just, a quick, quick show of hands, how many left-handed people are there here? Okay, actually it's uh, undersampled and a lot of you are lying. Um, not the ones that raised your hand, I, don't, I believe you. It's the, the passive form of lying. Um, so so it, that, uh, something like that, it's amazing because people have, uh, there's, there's a whole class of people's experiences in the world that have been underserved by traditional media. There aren't, there's not tons of shows or tons of media segments about left-handed people, but those in the room that are left-handed will tell you it is a transformative way to go through life. The, the guardrails are on the wrong side. Left-handed people don't live as long. I'm not kidding. It's more dangerous. The world is more dangerous. The scissors don't work, right? There's not the, there the coffee cups. Every coffee cup, the handle is f pointed the wrong way. They have to do this. Just the, the kilowatts of extra calories that they have to expend just converting a right-handed world to a left-handed world. It's incredible. Traditionally, the, the notion when you had limited amounts of attentional slots, you had a certain number of programs that you could air on a given night of television. You had a certain number of uh, uh, movies that you could keep in the theater in this wonderful history that Henry laid out. It made sense to measure your audi audience, as that little archival clip uh, you know, showed, and then program against buckets trying to capture as much of the audience into that bucket as possible, and it created terms like minimum viable relatability in the 90s in television program. And that generally uh, moves towards generality and to regressions of the mean, right? And what it does is it leaves out a lot of aspects of humanity and culture broadly, and it leaves out a lot of very subtle kinds of personalities and, uh, and ethnicities and cultures of origin and perspectives on the world, and those people have been underserved by traditional media. What this new sort of ushering 
brings in with social, where you can recognize yourself and use media to show people who you are, there's this incredible force that starts happening, and we have big, giant hits, which are called what it's like to be raised by Asian immigrant parents. Right? Very kind of niche, niche areas that when people see themselves for the first time, when they see this experience, and you've had it when you read uh, you know, a, a wonderful novel, that one line that turns a good book into a great book where you say, wow, I've never heard somebody articulate what I've been thinking this whole time. That is one of the most powerful aspects of modern media is the chance for us to fall in love with ourselves as, 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 a, as a species. Uh, again. And that's what that meant. So, <laughs> so there's this notion of the garden versus the stream, and it really c comes back to these two views. One where, you know, this incredible experience of giving yourself over to media, where you lose yourself in a way. And this other where you're surrounded by your social context, where the media also has some uh, tie to different people and different meanings that already exist in your life. And you can see this battle between these two spaces. Maybe it's not a battle, but these two parallel developments, even in virtual reality, where you put something over your face versus augmented reality, where it overlays into the context that's around you. And this is shaping the way that we think about uh, the future of media. So I'm just going to end on a, on a couple things which, which really uh, have to do with why I would be talking about this stuff here, which I hope you're starting to wonder. One is, as Henry pointed out, this notion of down-market short-form, roiling experimentation has been part of the cinema tradition for a long, long time. In fact, this is where the birth of cinema happened. And you know, when, when, we, when we have these uh, opportunities to create media that has all of these different perspectives and engages a whole new class of talent that is not willing necessarily to sit around for six months to see if a development deal is going to come through. They want to make stuff. They want to make lots and lots of stuff. This is an opportunity where all of a sudden we have uh, th things emerge, like uh, I have some of my incredible uh, uh, talent here in the room, and you know they came up with this concept of character universes, where, it, where you can actually just have a whole collection of people in a set, for example, and they work every day with s stuff from micro short form all the way out to, to larger tentpole uh, series and episodes, and all the while what they're doing is they're testing the capacity of the characters to engage in certain kinds of relationships. They're testing and in, uh, in helping the cinematographer, the DPs, to, to shoot better in the location, to start, and it all kind of moves together in this lovely, roiling, crazy pyramid. So just from the standpoint of character development, and as, as Henry said, this notion that the future of storytelling is going to be transmedia, these characters and character universes, whether they're scripted or unscripted, have presences of their own in lots of different aspects of social media where you don't have to manage it so much from a top-down kind of command and control structure, but you can literally let uh, you know, talented young people do what they're excited about and make lots of stuff and have it bubble up into the stuff that all of you want to get lost in eventually. And so that's what I'm going to leave you with, is that, is that to some extent, this parallel stream that I think a lot of people do point at as being some kind of a threat to cinema, I think has the amazing opportunity to reinvigorate it, to breathe new life, to breathe a whole new crop of diverse talent, diverse viewpoints, diverse ex experiences into this hallowed, amazing art form. Thank you so much. <laughs>